Amendment. Openly, and I've done it. If any of you have been following me for a couple years, you, you've seen me do it. Literally, I will do a video on the value of the Second Amendment the day of a school shooting. I never go, I never go, well, now's not the time. Here's the reason why. Because all 10 of the amendments of our Bill of Rights are our rights, and they're important every single day, all the time. There is always a time to speak about our rights, always. There is never not a time, ever. The First Amendment is the most important right, period. Without that, we got nothing. If we don't have freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of association, freedom of press, if we don't have that, we don't have society. That's number one over everything. And what did they make second? Defending the first. Defending the first. That has value. So some of them have said, well, we can't support Larry because he doesn't own a firearm. It's true, I don't. I live in New York City. I'd be insane to own a firearm. I'm serious. The odds of me going to prison shoot up tremendously. This is like a two hour window, I think it is in New York City, if you're going from a range to something, if you're not back in your house. Like, so like, if, yeah, I think two hours. Literally, if my car breaks down and I can get back to my house, or this traffic jam, I'm going to jail. I'm not joking, that's how bad New York City is. I'm going to jail. If you bring your legal firearm in New York City, you're going to jail. So why would I own a firearm in New York City? I shoot out when I leave the state. And whenever I'll, 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 shoot, I'll shoot in Utah, Oklahoma, I leave the state. And in fact, in Utah, they give me a veteran's discount. So yes, so, so yes, so I shoot when I leave the state. Exactly right. So yeah, uh, th th is that a reason to not? But it's the most important piece. Why do I have to have a horse in the race to care about the race? I support lots of things that don't affect me, right? I support changing family law. Doesn't affect me. I didn't go through the system. I support the Second Amendment. I don't own a firearm. I support lots of things. I support helping farmers. And you guys heard I talk about it all the time, supporting our farmers. I'm not a farmer. I support lots of things that, I, that, I don't, that don't affect me directly. I'm supposed to be the governor of New York, not the governor of me. So I should help everybody. My goal is to defend the rights of everyone against the, the local bully. So next, not just that. I've talked about my plan to get rid of SAFE Act. Talk about my plan to help with firearms in general. Let me cover that real fast if I can. Is it okay, guys? <coughs> All right. If you ask a Democrat about a SAFE Act, Democrat goes, SAFE Act's awesome. Doesn't go far enough. We need SAFE Act 2, 3, 4, and 5. It's working. Which working. Absolutely. It can't wait. But here's the funny part about that. With my plan, I talk to Democrats often. I talk to them. I know many of them. I live in Queens. I know lots of Democrats. And when I talk about what the SAFE Act actually does, their mind changes. It does. Here's the plan to get rid of the SAFE Act. And it isn't that hard. And it can be done by a governor. Number one, once I get into power in this, uh, January 2019, I'll begin to pardon people who are victims of the SAFE Act. About 1,000 people have been affected by SAFE Act violations. I will then pardon them. Because if you are convicted of a SAFE Act violation, you are by default a violent felon. So literally, if you had a piece of plastic on your firearm that His Majesty has deemed evil, you are now a violent felon. That's how it works. Those who will be pardoned. I already, get, I already get letters from prison already, and parents, I already get letters already, people saying, this, I'm one of the guys. Now, if you did something else, you got a safe act violation on top of that. You robbed the bank or whatever, and you had a safe act violation, you're staying in jail for robbing the bank, you're just getting a safe act violation removed. That's it. But if you just got a safe act violation, as some people have, you go home to your family. Get your life back. You shouldn't be in jail in the first place. What does that mean? That means now prosecutors will be like, why am I gonna bother doing safe act violations? Because he's just gonna pardon them anyway. So it'll stop. Second thing, I'm gonna tell law enforcement, this is your absolute lowest priority. Lowest priority of enforcement. So you're sitting around, picking your nose, finish picking your nose first. <laughs> then enforce safe. This is the least priority, period. Now the funny part is, I don't actually control all of law enforcement. But it doesn't matter. They will use it as an excuse. How do I know? They tell me in events like this. Most law enforcement does not want to enforce SAFE Act. Right? You, you go and you, you look at them, most of them, what do they want to do? They want to get bad guys. They don't want to count, okay, is that 11 rounds in your magazine or seven? Let me check. Oh, you're a criminal now. They don't want to do that. So I will allow them to stop doing that, and they will. What does that mean? Over the first year, 2019, the SAFE Act will become basically irrelevant. What will happen over that year? Several things. One, I'll be sued at least once, if not four times. I'll be in court my entire four years, assuming I survive it without being impeached. So I'm sure of that. No worries. I'll be destroyed by the press. I don't care, I'm destroyed by the press anyway. Totally fine, that'll happen anyway. So it doesn't matter, that's gonna happen. But what happens is when that happens, the Assembly and the Senate 
will see that I'm taking the heat. They will see that I will fly air cover for them. There are many people in the Assembly and the Senate who would like to repeal the SAVE Act, but they're afraid that they will actually lose their jobs. But if I'm actually taking the heat, they go, wait a minute, Governor Sharp's taking the heat. All right, maybe we can do this. That's number one. But number two, the press will be all over me. And as they're over me, I'll start saying the real damage of the SAFE Act. The average Democrat who supports the SAFE Act believes they're following. The average believes the following. The SAFE Act must make us safer. Why? One, safe is in the name. I'm not joking. I know that sounds crazy, but you're thinking about people who don't understand or care about gun culture at all. It's not their world. They don't think about it. Doesn't matter to them. Doesn't matter. It's very surface for them. So SAFE Act says safe. Two, it was, it, was, it was passed in 2013, and we haven't had a school shooting yet. Therefore, it works. That is literally how the average Democrat thinks about a SAFE Act. That's it. When I tell them, do you know it made millions of New Yorkers criminals overnight? They go, what do you mean? You mean like bad guys with machine guns shooting up banks? No, like the average firearm owner in New York State. It made the average firearm owner in New York State, millions of them, criminals overnight. And they go, oh, you seem to get shocked. Not just that, do you know that it literally makes our medical community part of a secret state police that has to report on people who have medical problems and mental problems? Oh, yeah. And then it has police officers have to go to people's homes and take those weapons when they don't even want to. You're putting law enforcement situations to where they have a choice of breaking their oath or feeding their families. That's what the SAFE Act does. And guess what? It's not made one school safer at all. Well, it had to. Great, please tell me one provision that stopped the school shooting. Well, I don't know any. So how do you know that? These are types of conversations that I'm actually gonna be able to have on a weekly basis over 2019. It'll be on the news, they'll be talking about it. What will happen? The average person who's anti-SAFE Act will become apathetic. They'll just, hold on a second, they'll just become apathetic. When they become apathetic, and there won't, be, there won't be Wild West shootouts, that's not gonna happen, there won't be that crazy stuff, they'll be apathetic. When they're apathetic, and now those people in the Senate and the Assembly who wanna repeal it will now have my air cover. And the last piece, as I've said before, I do not have a problem breaking a hole. I'm a Marine, I'll be first in. You guys gotta follow me through the breach. If you follow me through, and when I'm there, you're calling your assembly. Why, why, why? The SAFE Act hasn't been enforced in six months. Why do we still have it? Governor Sharp hasn't been enfor enforced in seven for nine months. Why do we still have it? You call, they become apathetic, I push it. Now 2020 comes, I go to the assembly and say, guys, let's repeal it. They repeal it. That's how the SAFE Act gets repealed. Now people say, but wait a minute, Larry, why don't you just executive order it? Because if I executive order it, I don't change the culture. If I don't change the culture, it goes away, then two years later we get SAFE Act 2, which is four times worse. But if I do that one year, and the people who are anti it go, whatevs, or even go, wow, it's bad, and then we change the culture and begin to shift New York State more towards a pro 2A state. Now, can I make it pro 2A in two years? No. <laughs> can I put it in the right direction? Yes, I can. Absolutely, because on top of that, I do something else. I'll add universal transportation rules. And we don't have that now. You take your farm into New York City right now, you're going to jail, legally owned. Legally purchased, legally owned, you're going to jail. I make a very simple rule. If you travel, and this is a bare minimum, if counties want to be more lenient, they should be able to be more lenient. But a very basic rule, no matter where you are in this state, any county, if your farm is legally owned and it is unlocked, I'm sorry, it is locked and unloaded, it's, go it's good. That may sound crazy. It doesn't exist right now. Not just that. Anybody know what the definition of loaded is in New York State? Ammunition in the vicinity of the weapon. I'm not joking. Box of ammunition here, unloaded firearm here, loaded. Loaded, that's New York State. I will change the definition, very simple, very simple. Bullets in the gun. I know, it sounds crazy. But that's it, are the bullets in the gun? No, not loaded. Are the bullets in the gun? Yes, loaded. That's simple, that's what I would do. And even the clock agrees. Yes. Do that and now we can at least transport our firearms wherever we want to transport them, at least something. Give me that, right? Don't go to jail. 
right, for, tra for, for carrying a legally owned firearm. Next thing I'll do, we'll change how it, how it is to get an actual permit. Right now, it's supposed to be six months, but it really depends upon, upon your county. It can be anywhere for six weeks to two years. Depends where you are. I want to make it 90 days. And I want to change it from may to shall. What does that mean? That means if they don't say yes, it is a yes automatically. If they want to say no, I'm okay. They can say no if they want to. I'm okay with that. Counties can have reasons. I'm okay with that. But there are two caveats. Number one, they must tell you why and they must give you an appeals process. If they tell you why and give you an appeals process, I'm okay with them saying no. You can't just go, I don't like people who wear white shirts. Nope, not good enough. Why did you say no at an appeals process? You do that, oh, counties can have their own rules. And 90 days. That will change everything. That is what I'm telling you. And I'm the only one with these rules. And every 2A group has said, don't vote for Larry Sharp. Because he doesn't own a firearm. I'm not joking. He doesn't own a firearm. That's why. You choose what you want to do, guys. You want someone to support the Second Amendment, you look at him. Right now, Democrats are anti-Second Amendment. And the second thing, Republicans are apathetic. Don't care. Don't care. They're fighting for our rights, got us safe act, and got us, and got us red flag laws getting to be passed right now. And has, has anyone even agreed or even said that they will actually veto the red flag laws? I will. Has, has a Republican? He hasn't even said that. So when red flag laws come, he's going to be okay with it. Stamp approval. And now when the next red flag law comes, now teachers will become part of our secret state police. That's the next red flag laws. More and more secret state police. I'm not okay with that, period. I am openly not okay with secret state police. I'm not okay with it, period. I'm not okay with it. No way. Great. Did I answer your question? Awesome. Someone over here have one? Yeah, go ahead. On Dave Rubin's show, he said yep. the first 100 days he was a non-violent drug Say it again, I'm sorry. On Dave Rubin's show, he yeah. said the first 100 days he was um, part of non-violent drug offenders. Uh, no, I didn't say that, but I came close, almost. Because I never say 100 days. I always say 90. Oh. That's how I know I never said 100. Well, yes. That's okay now. People will say 100. But no, I would say 90. I say 90 because I'm a business guy and we talk in quarters, right? I was talking quarters because I'm being a business guy. I was speaking quarters. That's how I know I didn't say 100, but I said 90, yes. And it won't be all of them, but yes, I'm, I'm going to begin to, I'm go, I'm going to begin to release them. And here's the problem. You can't release all of, the, all, all of them right away. Here's the reason why. I know some of you will be upset and some of you won't be upset, but as always, you will never hear me pander any, ever. I said my goal is Happy New Yorkers. Some of the people who are in prison, let me go into prison reform in general, and then I'll cover how to get them out. Is that okay? Can I, can I cover all that? Is that okay, guys? All right, number one issue. Prison reform is a huge problem in this state. And one of the reasons why, oh, go ahead. I want to get into all that, but I also, I, I, I've been trying to get in here for a little while. So good, yeah. You kind of hit on the one issue that concerns me. Go ahead. You were talking about magazine capacity. Yep. That really doesn't bother me that much. But when they, when they got into the Bill of Rights and all those things a few hundred years ago, a couple hundred years ago, they didn't intend us to go forward and use the Second Amendment in the way that it was supposed to be used with muscle loaders and flintlocks and stuff like that. That was not the intention. What is your opinion, and it's related to what we were just talking about, what is your opinion about the modern sporting rifle? What's your attitude toward the modern sporting rifle? I'm not sure what the question is. What's my the opinion on it? Rifle, we're talking about things like AR-15s. Are, are you saying, hold on, right are now. you saying do I want to ban AR-15s? Basically it. Oh, it's thank you. Good. Just say that. No. 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 It says right to bear arms, which, by the way, also includes mace, flip yeah. knives, arms. Yeah, but like I said, the, the, back when they wrote that, they hmm. were dealing with flintlocks and muzzleloaders. They were de no, today. what they were dealing with was the modern weapons of the day. That's what they were dealing with. Right. And AR-15 is a modern weapon of the day. It is America's rifle. I don't have a problem with it. Okay. Yes. Did I answer your question? Yes. Okay, good. So that, it, you can ask me directly. I don't mind. That was well, good. Yes. Yep. I, oh, good. I don't like to call them assault rifles. They're not select fire. They are not assault rifles. To be They're forward with you. Hold on. I don't care if they are. To be forward. I don't care if they are because we're going to make a dis decision on what an assault rifle is. Every other day it changes. Right? So I don't care if it's assault rifle. It doesn't matter. I don't care. Yeah. Whatever. It's fine. If counties want to make specific rules on that, I I'm not that concerned and they'll be fine. It's fine. Yes. I'm not concerned. To be, to be forward, we see what they say. People got mad at me. I did a video um, when I was at a gun show, 
And I was very upset with a lot of the people who are supposedly supporting our Second Amendment. And I said things like, the SAFE Act hasn't made any of the firearms or weapons any less deadly, right? Because people just went around it anyway. And they said, there's no SAFE Act. No, no, I saw it. I was at the gun show. There were people who were selling firearms that were just as deadly as, as, as before. They just got around the SAFE Act. They changed the stock, whatever. So what? So it doesn't have a pistol grip here, but it has this kind of grip. Who cares? It, it, they did it anyway. SAFE Act was useless. And it created a, a black market, a black market in ammunition and a black market in firearms. And the guys got mad at me. No, it didn't. You created a black market. Yes, it did. I know people who I know they own a firearm. I know it. And I say, so uh, what are you going to do with your firearm? And they say, what gun? Yes, you're laughing because you've seen people do that. They're afraid to talk about their firearms now. That's called black market. Again, when I, tell, when I tell Democrats that, they get scared. They go, oh, yeah, you're making law enforcement's job actually harder because nobody wants to register anymore. You're creating a black market. Nothing but bad. So why? I could. Let's ban AR-15s. And one or two things would happen. One, they'd sell them anyway, black market, number one. Or two, they'd make the AR-16, which would be exactly like the AR-15 with two changes that gets around my law. So why would I bother doing that? Even if I wanted to, it makes no sense. Let me be very clear. I'm gonna be clear on, I'm gonna give you a quick list on how often, every time that prohibition has worked. Finished. <laughs> Finished. Finished. I'm gonna change culture. So yes, I have no problem. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Awesome, good. Can I now go, what was the next thing I was gonna go into? Prison reform. Oh yeah, prison reform, yes. Is it okay, can I go there now, guys? All right, here's what I know about prison for sure. And I, and I noticed from a personal piece, some of you don't, may not know my story. My father was a corrections officer at Rikers Island before he passed away when I was a kid. And my mother, after he passed away, had a lot of problems to where she was addicted first to legal drugs and then eventually illegal drugs. And she was actually arrested and she was a felon. My mom was an addict. So I saw the prison system from both sides. So I understand how this works. The first thing I want to say is I know that in prison there are three types of people. Number one, the kind of person who's really bad and probably should never get out of prison. I get that. That person's in prison. And I'm happy they're in prison. Second thing, there's someone who should pay their debt. They made a mistake, they should pay that to society, and when they're done paying their debt, whatever that is, prison and parole, they should then have a second chance at life, go back and second chance at life, go ahead. And people who shouldn't be in prison, which includes most of the people who are arrested for having a plant in their pocket. Most of those people should not be in prison. Unless they had other charges, obviously, right? Because sometimes people steal to get that plant, in which case, you should be in jail for stealing, right? Or you hurt someone for that plant, in which case, you should be in jail for hurting someone. But if you just had a plant in your pocket, you probably shouldn't be in jail. I know that, but here's the issue. I don't know which one's which. I can't tell. You know who does know? The corrections officers who work with them every single day. They do know. They know. And what are we doing right now? We're punishing them. Any of you happen to be in corrections, anybody? Ah, so there we go, so you know. I'm gonna tell you stuff and you're gonna tell me if I'm wrong. At corrections officers, right now, they're, they're at life expectancy, 58 years. That's the life expectancy of a corrections officer. We should be ashamed of that. Not just that every correctional officer I've ever met knows exactly how much time they have until they're going to get out. Do you guys know how much time to get out? Thank you. Yes, he knows. Do you know? I'm sorry. With the, every, every correctional officer I know knows exactly what time they're going to get out when, when they're done. Yeah. Right. Everyone I know. Not, thank you. Yes. Everyone knows that. Not just that. Every correctional officer I've ever met knows someone who's committed suicide. Is that true? True? Yes. Everyone. We should be embarrassed, this is true. And not just that, they haven't had a, a contract in three years. Thank you. Yes, and I am the only governor candidate who has said specifically, I will give you a contract. I will give you a contract, because you know what's stopping the contract? Cuomo wants to make sure he can punish you. Yes, and you're fighting on the punishment clause. I'm okay, get it away, it's fine. I'll give you a contract. Why do I want that? Why does that matter so much to me? I love corrections officers, not more than anybody else. I love you all. Corrections officers too, right? But why? To be forward with you. I need you to fix this prison system. And right now I have an apathetic corrections officers um, environment. They're apathetic and they can't help me fix anything. Go ahead. Recently, uh, and this can be backed up, uh, my union had a, an article about this. Uh, Danny Lever, a spokesperson for the governor, recently said corrections officers are racist Yes, correct. So yes. Yes. Hundred percent. Yes. Uh, Cuomo was openly hostile towards corrections officers. Obviously, openly hostile. I'm not because I need you. How do I know I need you? Here's why. 
the most successful things that have been done in prison reform have been with corrections officers, not without them. And we are constantly doing these, we are bringing outsiders in to the prisons to try to fix things when we have corrections officers there who are more than happy to assist. I hear all the time corrections officers tell me, yes, Larry, I'm the guy's therapist. I'm that guy's marriage counselor. I'm that guy's legal attorney. I'm that guy's everything. I help these people out when they're in trouble. When they have gang problems, help them out to deal with that. I talk them off a ledge when they're in trouble. I do all these things already. Why aren't we using them? Here's an example of it. Right now they have a, 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 um, they have a situation in Massachusetts called the Humvee Program. The Humvee program is a program that takes two corrections officers and several volunteers to come in and puts people of one community together to make things better. One of the communities in this case is, is the veterans. In the, in the case of Massachusetts, the, at, the recidivism rate is 75%. With this program, less than 5%. Less than 5 Why? Because you put corrections officers in the mix. They're the ones who help pick the guys. They're the ones who decide the guys. They see who's the scammer guy who's really a gangbanger, and they pull him out and put him back in Gen Pop. They're the ones who know that. That's why you use them. And volunteers. Volunteers means no money. Corrections officers are already paying. We can get better service without extra taxes, without having to make a plan that we got uh, from Colorado that we have to pay a million dollars for from the federal government that comes in for one year and fails. That brings in four more people who don't know anything, and that fails too. We don't have to do that. Now here's the best part about that. I want to make that happen, by the way, with people who are nonviolent offenders, possession offenders. Why? Now people will say, well, Larry, these people only have pot in their, in, their, in their pocket. You should let them go right away. Here's my problem. Some of them have been in prison for years, many years. While they weren't violent when they went in, they are violent now. And that's unfair. And that's wrong. And that's our fault. I get that. And it's also true. And I don't want to put those people right back on the streets because right now they're violent. I don't want to do that. Now, I don't know which ones are and which ones aren't. Who knows? The COs who have watched them stab people or not stab people or get stabbed by people, they know they will help me decide which ones need to go where. And we then create a separations program. Like the military, when you get out from combat, they put you in a SEPS program. Do a very poor job of it. But we can do a better job of it by putting these people in a SEPS program kind of deprogramming them from prison life into regular civilian life and slowly putting them back out. Next thing, I can't just let 10,000 people out into New York State when we don't have jobs people who are already here. Then I put 10,000 felons on the street who have criminal records, who haven't worked in anywhere from three to 10 years with no resumes. I'm asking for failure, it's cruel to everybody. So while righteously, I probably should just go, you should get out of jail, goodbye. To make sure I have happy New Yorkers, I shouldn't. It's wrong. And it makes some people unhappy. They don't like it. I'm telling you the truth. I want happy New Yorkers. So SEPS program, the guy left who asked the question, right? Anyway, yes. Guy asked the question. SEPS program for these nonviolent possession offenders until they can get back on a system. And the system as a whole has to use corrections officers as part of the solution. They're part of the solution. We do that, we can make a better prison system. Without having to close any more prisons or open any prisons. Without having to hire extra people. We don't have to. Happily, I know this, there are corrections officers who would happily shift into more of a therapy style, helpful style job for maybe a year or two. Happily. And then shift back. Some would be prison guards. Some don't. Some of these guys, I heard, the, the phrase I heard from a correction officer was, Larry, I'm getting too old to roll around on the floor with these guys. That's what he told me. And I was like, great, wouldn't you want to run one of these programs? He's like, yes, I would. I would love to. So it's voluntary. The unions will be happy. I'm not forcing anybody to do anything. It'll be CEOs that want to do it. And there's tons of them. And then we'll add. The best example I can give you is uh, putting the uh, iPads in prisons. I'm not by default unhappy about someone deciding they put iPads in prison. That's not by default a bad thing. The way it was done was a bad thing. Because CEOs weren't really asked. It was just put them in. And the CEOs are like, but that's going to fail because of this, because of that. You don't know any better because you're evil. Go in. If we were to use to make it right, it could have worked right. So did I answer your question, my friend? I'm sorry, he's walking away. Did I answer his question? Was that his question? Whose question was that? That was good. Yes, good. Excellent. So I hope I covered the, the prison reform piece. Good. Any other questions or comments? I'm happy to take any others of anything. Go ahead. How are you? So I, uh, I'm a sectarian and I've been one for about five years now. Thank you. I would say that's true. Yeah, 
but not always immoral. Violence is immoral if it's uninitiated. Yeah. Violence is immoral if it's uninitiated. Um, so my question is, as far as police go, sure. how do you feel about modern police using body cams to make sure they're doing their job? Yeah, right? look, I, I, I am very, I, there are several ways we can help our police force. There are several ways. Number one, we can stop with this crazy war on marijuana, right? There shouldn't be a war on drugs. It's silly. It's, it's making cops do things they shouldn't be doing. We should get rid of the SAFE Act. I mean, it's making cops do the, We should stop those, those, get rid of those laws and wars that have no actual value, right? That aren't actually, that, to the point, that, that's uninitiated violence, right? Yep. So that, that should end. Cops should be doing things like stopping bad guys. That's what they should be doing. That's number one. So start that culture of that, right, where cops are not about generating revenue. Here's what I know. There's no, no police officer who was sitting in the academy one day and goes, oh, I'm in academy, great. I cannot wait to be a revenue source. <laughs> That's never happened. I can't wait to be all about the money, right? No, one's, no cop ever said that. So let's stop that idea first, right? We do that and we'll find happier cops. When I talk to state troopers, many of them tell me things like, Larry, I feel terrible because I spend 90% of my time with 10% of the people, right? But then when I spend time with, with good people, it's, it's only giving them tickets and making them bad. But we just talked to a woman today, Zach was there? I told the woman today at a, at a diner who said, my last encounter with, with a cop was great, right? If, she, if I remember the story right, correct me if I'm wrong. Oh, you were there too, weren't you? Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, she said uh, her car spun out in the winter and a trooper came to her and stayed with her until the, the mechanics and tow trucks came. And she felt so safe and she felt protected. It was at night. We need more troopers doing that. The protecting and serving. The protecting and serving parts. That's a cultural issue. Now in the actual physical training issue. I'm okay with cameras if local communities want cameras, I'm fine with that. But what I also like is de-escalation. The number one issue is de-escalation. Number one over everything else. There are too many police officers that immediately go to violence or go to a firearm, not because they want to, because they're not taught anything else. But not just that. When you see a guy come at you with a bunch of military looking gear, you could be afraid. So there are other police forces who are doing it a little bit differently. We should copy some of them. Boston does some good stuff, and there's other couple uh, cities I don't remember off the top of my head to do good, good stuff like. They have one uniformed a police officer and one in almost like a semi-civilian clothes, right? Kind of like polo shirt and, and pants, slacks, like that. So depending upon the situation, you know, they've got some gangbang stuff going on. I want the hardcore cop there. They got domestic abuse. You might want you might want the plainclothes cop kind of there first to see if he can de-escalate first, right? And one is trained more with how do we keep the situation calm? I think we start doing that much better because now they'll also cross-train each other, right? So the de-escalation cop will also see when you got to throw a guy on the ground and the guy who throws people on the ground will see when you don't need to throw a guy on the ground, right? They'll both also see those two also. I think you add that, you'll change everything. The key is de-escalation. That's the key. Did I answer your question? Awesome, good, all right. And to be clear, sometimes you gotta throw a guy on the ground, I get it, but not always. Sometimes you don't have to. Let's not, let's not go to throw a guy on the ground. Let's do when we have to. Great, go ahead. What about reciprocating licenses between different states? Oh my God, all right, um, this is, this is a, yeah, you're talking firearms or professional or both? Both. All right, both. firearms be forward, you guys, and this is gonna make some of you unhappy. Right now, that's a bridge too far, just is. As I said, this state's very anti-2A. Let me get the things I talked about earlier in play in the first two years, then let's talk about that. If I go too far, I'll get nothing. Does that make sense? If I go too far, I'll get nothing. Give me the two years to do the SAFE Act, universal transportation laws, changing how we deal with per per permits, then let me look at the, the landscape and see what the next step is. Does that make sense, guys? I'm, I, I don't want to tell you stuff I can't promise you. I don't want to promise if I can't deliver, right? So that's one. But now professional. Oh my God, we have to revamp this. This is embarrassing. Some of you not know, if you're a doctor in state A, you can't be a doctor in state B. Or a hairdresser. Yeah, I'm sorry? A hairdresser. Or a hairdresser. I mean, what is wrong with us? What, if some doctor wants to come to New York State and work here, why would we say no? They're coming from, you know, some place where they don't have this. They come from Zimbabwe. I mean, they're coming from like Connecticut. I'm serious, they're coming from like Connecticut and we're like, oh, Connecticut people are backwards, they don't know medicine. What's wrong with us? That's how we are, you're totally correct. The whole thing has to be revamped. Here's my issue, I'll deal with two parts of licensing, two parts. Number one, 
how do you, when should someone have a license? A very simple rule on this. Would you ask your friend to do it? That's my very simple rule on this. We actually have licensing for braiding hair in New York State. Licensing for walking a dog in New York State, right? So I'll ask you. My dear, if you wanted your hair braided, would you ask your friend to braid it? Yes. Sure, of course you would. Why's your license, right? I don't know if you have a dog, but if you have a dog, would you ask your friend to walk your dog? Sure. Sure, why not? Why's your license? Would you ask your friend to remove your kidney? No. Probably not. Get a license. <laughs> Perfect. Get a license. I'm fine with that. That's my general rule, right? If you wouldn't ask your friend to do it, get a license. I'm fine. That's step one. Why do I say that? Because asking people to get licensing for things that don't matter just hurts people trying to step up the ladder. Right? It hurts the poor and the person who's in trouble or the person trying to make a step in their life. The guy who starts a, a hair braiding business or the gal who starts that business, she's just trying to get ahead. Why are we punishing her? She's trying to provide value in her community. Why are we punishing her? Guys, it's a dog walking business. That's a good thing. If, let's do it. I'm happy with that. But now the next piece you talk about, how about professional license? You should have a license. Why in the world would we try to stop professionals from coming to this state? That's what they do. If the person has a license in a state that's a real state, I don't care what the state is, it's a real state where people aren't dying every day, then that license should be good in this state. You make a couple bucks, fine, charge them a transfer fee. Fine, they gotta pay a hundred bucks to transfer the license over, so government gets his cut. I hate it, this tastes bad even in my mouth saying it. But fine, if you gotta, if you, if the, you gotta get your cut somehow, fine, I'll take that. You pay a hundred dollar fee and you get your license. Come here if you're a doctor, come here if you're a plumber, come here if you're, I don't care what you are. Come here if you're a professional, I want you in this state. Absolutely, thank you for that question. That should be the rule. A small fee to, you know, print the new license or put it in a database. Fine, we're good. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Awesome. Any other questions or comments? Go ahead, please. Uh, there's been a, a transition with how Medicaid's been facilitated through local departments and social services. Yes. It's being taken over completely by the state and it's they're taking it in phases. Yep. And um, I wasn't sure what your thoughts are on that, if it should be given back to the local departments. I know, I know with your education plan you're saying the decentralization of that, you know, give it, give it back to the local districts, let them handle it. Yeah, as a general rule, the problem is New York State is one of the only states where the counties actually pay for Medicaid, right? Most states, they don't do that. Most of the, the state pays for it, right? I would rather the state pay for it. I'd rather pull it all out of the county totally. I'd rather have no unfunded mandate for that at whatsoever. The state pay for it totally. Make it transparent. Let us all see it and make it paid by, for by the state, period. And that would take everything out. Just boom, simple, done. Yes, good. Yes. Look, I am, I am, I am about central, de de decentralization, but there are certain things that the Constitution says we have to deal with, or the federal government says. Why am I punishing my local communities with that? Right? I even think there should be any school tax. Right? School should be paid for directly from the state. There should be no school tax. There should be a flat fee that comes from the state, and that should be it. And no cronyism. I'm gonna build your. Uh, I'm gonna build your uh, your um, football field because my buddy has a construction company. So I'm gonna give $10 million to your local district. None of that. My, my idea of funding schools is grossly simple. It is, I mean, I mean grossly simple. It is how many students are in your district? Great. Times, I'm thinking maybe 17K, give or take. Here's your check, have a nice day. That's it. No extra, no extra fighting the state for extra money. No asking the federal government for grants. No asking the federal government, uh, the local, the, the, any other government for any of the money whatsoever. You get that money. Right now, if you don't spend your money, what happens? You lose it. You lose it. But this would be that way. There's your money. Good luck. What does that mean if you have extra money? <gasps> you save it. Look at that. You can save your actual money, save your budget. Oh my God, wouldn't that be amazing? But even better, I have only one string. My string is the same, transparency. I wanna see where the money's going, how you're spending it. Otherwise, good luck. What will that mean? a mass amount of administrators can go away. Mass amount of administrators can go away, tons of them. We have school districts now that have more administrators than they have teachers. The average teacher makes about 80K a year. The average administrator makes over, over six figures. You get rid of two administrators, you can hire three teachers. Easy. Or give them raises, or buy more stuff, or whatever. Guess who's the one guy who won't be deciding what you buy? This guy. I won't be deciding. You will. 
I had a guy tell me one day, he goes, Larry, if we had a farm in our high school, we have a better high school. Like we had a farm in our junior high school. We'd have a better high school. We should have a junior high school with a farm on it. And I said, that sounds great. He goes, yeah, we can't. I said, why? He goes, well, because, I said, when I'm governor, if your district believes that's right for your local community, build a farm. Do it. Why? You know better than I do. That's why. I'm not a farmer. I don't live in your community. You do. Enjoy. If that makes sense, do it. It's your money. Well, I'm the only guy who says, let teachers teach. Then I actually say, let them teach. I don't add in administrators. Teacher, teachers union hates me. Teachers love me. Lo everyone I meet loves me. So tell them that. The teacher called me up on a radio show once. She said, Larry, I got a problem. I said, what? She said, the problem I have now is I got young kids, four or five years old, coming into school now, into kindergarten, don't know anything. They don't know their numbers, their colors, their letters. They know nothing. I said, wow, that's terrible. She goes, yeah. I said, how can you fix it? Note, I asked her, the teacher, the person on the ground in front of the kids, how can you fix it? She said, Larry, I have an idea. I said, what? She said, I want to pay the parents. I said, what? I want to pay the parents. 50 to 100 bucks. If their kids come in and pass a test, that means they know all the colors and numbers, I'll pay the parents 50 bucks. I thought to myself, what a terrible idea. That's what I thought. Then what I told her was, okay, try it. Why did I say that? Because I could be wrong. That's why. I could be wrong. I'm not in her school district. I don't know her parents. I don't know those kids. She does. If her school district says that's a good idea, they should try it. I shouldn't step in. Even though in my heart I thought that's a bad idea. I could be wrong. Now, she's one school district. If they actually try it, the school district may say no. But say they say yes, they try it. What if it fails miserably? They just give a bunch of money away for nothing. Or no one gets it and they give the money away. So what? We now learn. They're transparent. No one else will try it. What if it does work and I'm totally wrong? And they give away some money, but their kids get better scores. They're doing well. They know stuff. And it's a success. Others can copy it. It's great. I don't mind. I walk the walk that I talk. I do it. I say they know better. I let them do it better. 100%. Does that make sense? But it's the best part. If you do it that way, schools will only consolidate because it makes sense for the kids to consolidate. There's no extra money involved. You get the same amount of money per kid, period. It doesn't matter. So should there be two high schools or one high school? It won't be because if I do it, the government will give me an extra $100 million to build a new high school, which is what happens now. It'll be because that's the right answer to service my community. Then good. Someone asked me, Lionel, if you, if you cut out the grades, will this and that change? I don't know. I don't care. You tell me. Maybe it makes sense to put all the kids in one high school. Maybe it doesn't. I'm okay with that. Your community, not mine. Your community, not mine. For those of you who don't know, I'll give you real fast my, my education plan. Number one, no standardized testing until high school. Standardized testing goes away. It goes away because it, it does not, it's an unfair way of grading teachers. It's an unfair way of grading schools. It doesn't help the kids in any way, shape, or form. It makes the kids who don't test well feel stupid. It's bad. It goes away. When that goes away, we will lose about $4 billion in federal funds, but we will also lose something else. All those administrators from that deal with the federal government go away. More administrators going away. More surpluses to the local school districts. More, even better. Nothing but good. On top of that, we lose Common Core. Good, don't care, lose Common Core. Don't care, it's gone. All good, don't matter at all. Not just that, we want school not to go from K through 10 to 12 anymore, K through 10. 10th grade, you're done. You pass the test, you get a high school diploma. What happens next? Five choices. Choice number one, you, want, you think college is right for you? Awesome. Go to prep school. Go to prep school. Why would I want you to go to prep school versus just staying in 11th and 12th grade? Because right now, any of you who've been in high school recently know, the last two years of high school are gym, study hall, video games, and probably smoking weed. That's what it is. So of course, how do I know that? When you go to the first year of college, it's 13th grade because no one's ready for college anymore. Because if it's in the last two years, screwing around. Then it takes them six years to graduate college as an average if they even graduate. Now you're 24 years old, never had a job, and people wonder why you have no work ethic. Yeah, we set you up that way, that's why. Or worse, 24 years old, you got $100,000 in debt, a college degree that has no value, you gotta work at Starbucks. We wonder why you're unhappy at 26 years old. We set you up that way. How about instead, now you decide at 16, what should you do? You think college is your way? I'm okay with that. For some people, college is the answer. 
The problem is we've been told a lie. And the lie is the only way to success is college, nothing else. That's simply not true. That's a way to success, not the only way. It's a way. If you think it's your way, two-year prep school, you get into that college ready to rock and roll, take advantage of internships, take advantage of, of incubators, now you rock and roll, you graduate maybe in three years, you're good to go. You don't like that, no worries. You're the super smart kid. You're the super smart kid who can take an SAT at 16 and get into college. Do it. Don't be bored. Go. You're that brilliant kid who probably has no friends, uh, but still is really good at taking tests. You're awesome. You're a brilliant kid. You're going to be a scientist. Go now. Go to, go to college now. Get a two-year degree. Go, off you go. You don't like that. No worries. Go to trade school. Two-year trade school. We need tradesmen desperately in this state. Desperately. Go to a trade school. Learn to be a locksmith or a carpenter or a mechanic or a plumber, whatever, whatever's your, your thing. Now, two years later, you're 18, you either have a license or you're ready for an apprenticeship. Either one. You get to go. Boom, life is good. You don't like that? Go, 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 to, go to work. Work here. Go to work. Get a job. Learn what it means to have a work ethic. Learn what it means that when your boss says show up at 8, that means 8, not 9.30. Learn that. You know many people I know who are in business? who tell me all the time they can't hire people because they simply won't show up on time? Yes, all the time. They simply won't show up on time. They don't get that. When your boss says eight, he actually means 7.45, so you can start working at eight. So he actually means. They show up at 9.30. They think eight means, oh, early. All the time. So learn what, that, learn what it means to have a boss. Learn what that means at 16 now. Learn what it means to pay taxes. So you get your, you, I make 10 bucks an hour. No, I don't, I make seven. Learn that now. You do that, you can change exactly how things work. If you don't like that, start a business. I don't care, do whatever you want. But start working now at 16. You start working at 16, we'll have better kids, happier kids. And if you work at 16, you can work for a lower wage, which means less requirements of foreign labor and more kids trying new things. More kids working in gun shops, more kids working in, in, in um, I'm sorry, on farms. More kids doing stuff to see what they like, what they enjoy, what makes them happy. Note happy. But I'm not even done with that. How do you pay for that? Very simple. New York State says you have to pay for grades 1 through 12. When I was a Marine, I got out of the Marine Corps, I got a GI Bill. I got X number of dollars for X number of years I could use, right? In this case, we give the kids $20,000 and seven years to use it. Same thing. 20K, sit in the bank for them, go off to any school they want, $20,000, seven years to use it. Here's what I promise you. Prep schools will pop up all over the place. Good prep schools will pop all over the place. Guess how much they cost for two years? $20,000. Trade schools will pop all over the place. How much will they cost? $20,000. Of course. There is the best part about this. We right now pay $22,000 per kid. With this plan, we pay $10,000 per kid. We, sa we save $12,000 per kid. There's about 400,000 11, 12th graders in New York State. That's your $4 billion. We made the federal funds right back, still retain surplus, happier kids, better results. This is the plan of the future. It's already happening in other, in other countries throughout the world. It's starting at 16. We can do it. It can work. That's how we can save money and have better. And note, every single thing I told you, not one extra taxpayer dollar. Everything I told you, focused on happy New Yorkers. Everything I told you, better results, more efficiency. Every single thing. That's every plan I have. Any other questions? Awesome. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yes. Thank you. Yes, number five. Yes, absolutely. Yes. I'm sorry? 3521. Oh, is that right? Hold on. That's logistics, right? Basic auto mechanic. Auto mechanic. I'm sorry. Yes. Oh, 35. Yes. That's very true. All right. 3,000 logistics, right? 3,500 transportation. Yes. I was in 08 and 02. Artillery and intelligence. Yes. I was in, I was in for seven years. So I did I two MOSs. So, yes. Um, yes, I was a Marine, proud Marine. I'll, I'll give you a quick story on this. I actually wanted to join the Army. I didn't want to join the Marine Corps. I wanted to join the Army. I did because my father was in the Army, so I wanted to join, my, go join the Army like my father did. So I took off when I was 17. Still, I was still in, the, um, in, the, in high school at the time, and the recruiting office I went to had all four recruiters in the same, in the same um, place. So I go to the Army recruiter, and I'm like, hey, can I join? He's like, yes, uh, awesome. We're going to make you a general in a month, right? You're going to be crossing the, you're going to be traveling the world, meeting beautiful women. It's going to be awesome. I thought, wow, this is great. Oh, the Army's awesome. Going to give you a billion dollars for college and get you a doctorate degree and nothing, everything's great. So I'm walking outside. I've got all like the Army book cover and stuff. I was in high school, walking out happy and proud. Marine Corps recruiter is there. He says, hey, son, you got a second? 
Sicho brings me in, sits me down. He goes, that army guy, he promised you a lot, right? I said, yeah, I'm going to be a general in like a month. I'm going to be, you know, running the whole army. It's going to be great, right? He said, that's awesome. He goes, we call that the solar plan. Everything under the sun. He goes, here's what I promise you. One thing, four hard years. Are you ready? I said, yes, and I signed up. And that's how I joined the Marine Corps. Now, the funny thing is, then I didn't know why. But now I look back and it's obvious. My father had passed away when I was a kid. I was 12 when he died. When my father passed away, I remember um, searching for positive male role models. I didn't have any in my life. I just didn't have positive male ro role models in my life. And the Marine Corps gave me tons of positive male role models. And it was the right thing for me. I say it all the time, I saved my life. It's, it's not right for everybody. Not everybody should be a Marine, everybody should join the military. Not right for everybody. But for me, it was exactly the right answer. It, uh, without it, I'd be a punk. I learned how to be a man, learned how to lead. I learned how to responsibility. I learned all the things that made me successful to this day. So yes, very happy, happy I was in the Marine Corps. My first part of the Marine Corps, I was in the ground side, artillery, and sometimes I spent infantry as a forward observer. And then my second time, I was in intelligence and spent most of my time with the air wing. So I spent, I did both sides. Great. All right, guys, let me tell you the last piece if I could. Last piece of advice I can give you. If, and this comes from actually a union that was talking to me and decided if they're going to endorse me or not. They asked me at the end of the interview, they said, Larry, just overall, why should we endorse you? And I said, it's a very simple issue. If you are happy with the way New York State's run, if you think things are going well, you're okay with this, don't endorse me. You should support Cuomo, you'll be fine. It'll stay exactly as it is now, just get a little bit worse as the spiral continues to go down. Go, no worries. But if you actually want change, there is only one person who can provide that, and that's me, for only one reason. I'm the person who, if I come in second, we still get change. If the Republican comes in second, nothing changes. The Democrat comes in second, nothing changes. If I come in second, everything changes. But if I win, the whole country changes. That's how that works. You've got to vote gold this time to make sure you get change. If you want to help to make that happen, here's my biggest issue. It's not my policies. I'm the only one with policies. And I'm not making that up. Go, go ask Cuomo or Molinaro for their answers. You get, you get philosophy and jargon, right? If you're a Republican, here's what you get. We're going to invest. If you're a Democrat, we're going to fund. Those two words mean taxes. Taxes. When you asked me questions, I gave you real plans. None of them included raising your taxes. Not one. There's only include raising taxes. Not just that. I'll tell you I could be wrong. Help me make it right. I just want to happen New Yorkers. Right? So go ahead. Are there going to be any debates? There may be debates. There may be. It'll, be, it'll be in about two weeks, three weeks if there is. There may be, yes. Uh, Lieutenant Governor and Governor. And if there are debates, I will be in them, yes. Correct, yes. I'll be in them, yes. So they don't have any answers, right? If you want answers, I'm the guy with answers. But not just that, I'm the guy who crosses over. Right? Republicans get Republicans, Democrats get Democrats. I get both plus others. That's the difference. So if you care about that, make it happen. You want to make it happen? Help me out. The biggest hole I have is name recognition. I've been using grassroots like there's no tomorrow. I'm the guy using podcasts and Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. I'm using those and I'm getting my name out, which doesn't show up in polls, by the way. Poll, when you do polling data, they're calling people who are likely voters with landlines. Likely voters tend to be over 40 and landlines people over 40, right? That's who they're calling. No one else are they being, uh, is being called. The people who are jumping on me, it's some of them, but many of them don't fall in, fall in. So you can't tell by polls. We have to just get our name out. How do we do that? Go to LarrySharp.com. Go to Larry Sharp for New York. When you go on Facebook, when you go on Twitter, when you go online, if you see any, and I mean any article, any video that has anything to do with Larry Sharp, excuse me, put my name down. You know people I've met who said, yeah, I heard of you because I was on the Cuomo page. Yeah, they're on the Cuomo page and they see people going, what about Larry Sharp, what about Larry Sharp? And they, and they check me out and they come. So please, if you're on any page, anywhere, is there anything about New York, please put my name down. Next, share, 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 share. Next, tell your family and friends and people you know. You don't have to sell me if you don't want to. If you want to, please sell me, I'd love you to sell me. You don't have to sell me. Just tell them that I'm running. When they actually take a chance and look at me and show up to one of these events and ask me questions, they'll see, I'll have an answer. I'll talk to them. I need you guys. Why do I need you guys? When I win this thing, 
I'm not going to have party infrastructure. I'm not going to have a bunch of people behind me. I need you behind me or I can't win. As I said, I will break a hole. I will do it. You have to follow me through. When we win, that's the beginning of the war, not the end. That's when it starts to turn the state around. So it's LarrySharp.com, and that's Larry Sharp with an E. And the E stands for? Electable. Electable. Yes, it does. Thank you, guys. Me up for selfies if you want. Thank you. Thank you for coming, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming.